2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we did not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Father, we are thankful for your word. We are grateful that you have provided us with your word, Lord, that you have made it accessible, that we can read it, that we can study it, that we can mull over it and to be instructed by it. Lord, it is food to us, Lord. In the language of the Old Testament, it is a lamp unto our feet, it is a light unto our path. And I pray, Lord, this morning that you would give us ears to hear what your word is saying to us. In Jesus' precious name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's interesting that we think about the life of Paul, who was writing 2 Corinthians. He was raised up, we would say today, in church. He was raised to know the Lord from an early life, but he ended up in darkness and completely blinded to the truth of Jesus Christ. That is, until Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. Now, saints, Paul was contemporary with Jesus, and the fame of Jesus went throughout all of the region. So I have very little doubt that Paul probably heard Jesus preach. He probably experienced the very unction of God that went forward when he would minister. But there was something in his mind, there was something in his heart that was darkness. And the enemy had blinded his eyes, or in the language of, again, Paul, the veil was over his heart so that he could not see the truth of what Jesus was trying to communicate. And saints, listen, it takes a personal experience in God. It takes personal repentance before the veil, if you will, can be pulled off our heart, before the blinders will come off until we finally see the truth for ourselves and respond rightly to the Lord. Jesus said it in John chapter 3, verse 19. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They don't want to come to the light lest their deeds should be exposed. They don't want them to be tried. I was thinking as I was studying for this message that Jesus told us to be the light of the world. He said, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And the fact that we are the light of the world is only the fact that the glory of God is in our life. In other words, we are burning with the fire of the Holy Spirit. How many of you know the brighter that the fire is, the brighter the light is? And saints, I want to be burning for the Lord. I want to be burning because that is where the light comes from. When you're on fire for God, when you're burning for God, saints, the very presence of God emanates from your life and it impacts the people around you. When we begin to dim down and get very, very dim, then the impact that we make becomes less and less. But Jesus was burning. He was a light shining in darkness. He said, this is the condemnation. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness rather than light. And Paul was right in the middle of what Jesus was talking about. As a matter of fact, Paul was a Pharisee not just any Pharisee. He said that he was more zealous of the traditions than the others that were before him. 
He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. So when Jesus would say things rebuking the Pharisees and their hypocrisy, when he would say things that were against the religious leaders, he had people like Paul, when he was known as Saul at the time, square in his crosshairs. He was referring to them. And how many of you know, if you do not have a tender heart, if you don't have a heart that is receptive to God's word, you will harden yourself against what is being said rather than change. And clearly, this is what Paul did. The more that Jesus preached, the darker his mind got. The more he resisted God, the more he resisted the Holy Spirit. And it is a shocking thing to consider. Paul was the type of guy that if you were to walk up to him and ask him something about the Bible, he could have probably quoted the first five books of the Old Testament, which we know as the Torah or the Pentateuch. He very likely would have memorized much of the entire Old Testament that the Jews called the Tanakh. So he knew God's word. He had God's word in his heart. But he was fighting against the Lord. He was doing everything he could to resist the Holy Spirit in his life. He wouldn't let God deal with him. You see, he was very religious, but he was not spiritual. And there is a difference. I was looking at some old photos of, I've seen them of Kansas City, and there are even some that I just saw this morning of St. Joe, where there were people that, did you know that just ordinary people walking the streets, saints wore a suit like I'm wearing now with a hat on their head, the men did. I mean, it was everybody, except the guy sweeping the street. He was wearing a uniform. But you know, saints, the Victorian era placed a huge emphasis on the outward person. You, you would see women, they would be wearing these really big, bulky kind of dresses and things. And I'm not knocking that. I'm simply saying this was how they were expressing, as it were, their life and particularly their faith in those days. But saints, it's not about the outward appearance. It's not about the fact that I'm wearing a suit this morning. It is what is the hidden man of the heart. What is on the inside? That is what matters. And if the inside of me is right, it will reflect in the glory of God. In other words, I will be a light in the world. Paul was doing everything religious. He probably had on all the religious garb. He probably walked around with his tallit, which was his prayer shawl. He'd probably throw it up over his head and pray like everyone else. He knew all of the things to do. In other words, he knew where to say amen. He knew when to shout hallelujah. He knew everything there was to know about being religious. But he was not spiritual. And there is a great difference. As a matter of fact... Throughout the course of his life, he turned against Christ, fighting against the Holy Spirit to the point to where he began to persecute the church. And he wasted it. When Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, it's interesting that what Jesus said to him was Saul, which was how he was known then. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You say, well, he was persecuting the people. That was just his way of expressing his persecution of Christ. You see, he was against Jesus. He was persecuting Jesus. And the people were just a point of contact for what he was doing. What he was doing was against the Lord himself. And Jesus asked him, why are you persecuting me? What are you doing this for? Why are you against me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. He heard Jesus preach, and God undoubtedly dealt with him, but he hardened himself. He watched people that he persecuted and killed lovingly and faithfully serve the Lord to the end. I've often wondered when Paul got older if he didn't have nightmares maybe about this, or maybe he'd just be bothered by the fact he would see the faces of people that he had persecuted. He'd see these poor women and these children that would be crying and asking for mercy, but he would be just merciless to these people. You see, his heart was full of darkness. He was religious, but he was full of darkness, and that is a horrible place to be. He heard Stephen cry out, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He heard him say to the Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit as they stoned him. But Paul 
watching over the garments of the people that were doing it, his heart was still in darkness. Think of that. Stephen, the light of Christ penetrating, just, just penetrating in his life. And yet, still, no movement. And at some point, somebody might say, you know what? I don't think this guy is ever going to be saved. I think this guy is going to die lost. He has seen so many miracles. He has seen people go down into the grave trusting the Lord. But yet still, he's not changed. He's still in darkness. His heart is still hardened. But then one day, saints, understand that God had an appointment for him to be changed. God had an appointment for Saul to be changed. He was on his way to Damascus, going to do more damage to the church, believing that he was undoubtedly in his mind in the darkness where it was and that thinking that he was moving in, possibly doing God a service, but he was persecuting Jesus. You see, Jesus met him on the road. The Bible said that there was a light that shined that was so bright and the people saw it as well. And that the light was so bright that it blinded Saul, but not the others. We're not told the others were blinded. They saw the light. They heard a voice. They didn't hear the voice. They heard a voice. Paul heard the voice. They just probably heard something that sounded like somebody talking, but Saul's ear was dialed in to the Hebrew language and the words that were being spoken. In that moment, you see, God had an appointment for Saul. He had a time when he was going to do a work. He was going to call him and turn him from his evil. And saints, listen, sometimes it takes God's intervention to change people. It takes God's intervention to change people. Their heart is so hardened. Their mind is so darkened that it's like no amount of light seems to be able to penetrate. I mean, I can't even imagine what it would be like to see and hear Jesus preach and still walk away in darkness. To see someone like Stephen ministering, crying out to the Lord and still go away in darkness. Later in Paul's life, he characterized it saying, I was the chief. Of sinners. And the old time preacher said, Well, if God can save the chief, he can save all the Indians. He was the chief. He said, Because God used me as an example moving forward of his grace, of his ability to save and to change people. Saints, listen to me. America is in darkness. And we are the light of the world. And many people in the world today and in America, saints, listen, have run roughshod over all the grace that God has shown them. Oh, it wasn't God. That wasn't God that did it. Oh, it was us. We did it. Oh, it was our technology. Really. Saints, listen, I happen to believe that without God's intervention, COVID could have killed all of us. Hmm? Without God's intervention, it could have wiped out this entire earth. Yeah. But he's like, oh, it's our technology. It saved us. And listen, that's what you do when you're in darkness. You do not give God the glory. Right. Yeah. You don't give God the credit. You explain it away. It was something else. Well, you were healed. Well, you were healed, but what was the doctor's? Well, you didn't even go to the doctor. Well, it must have been a fluke. Maybe it was misdiagnosis. See, when you're in darkness, you explain away everything that God does. You don't give glory where glory's due. You don't give credit where credit is due. I think about there was a man in the Old Testament by the name of Nabal. And Nabal is, if you don't know this, is the Hebrew word for fool. It means to wilt. Plant wilts not because of anything other than it doesn't have light or it doesn't have water. Maybe you've put some Roundup on it, but I'm just saying, normally speaking. 
But this man had wilted. God had been good to him. And David had been good to him. David had been watching over his flocks and his herds and all of these different things. But when it came time for David to go down and ask for some provisions, this man Nabal said, who is this man David? You know, there's a lot of men done escaped off the farm type thing. And I mean, he greatly insulted David. And I told somebody once before and I was talking to them and I said, you know, I said, this is exactly what people do to God. God's good. God's watching over them. He's protecting them. And when it comes time for God to get a little bit of glory, that's well, what, what, what should I give that to God for? I've seen people say the most demonic and diabolical things, refusing to give glory to God that your ears have ever heard. I have seen people say things that the animals will begin to bark at them. They were so evil. Listen, saints. It takes God to pull a person out of that kind of darkness. Amen. It takes God to do it. Now, I would like to think that I could talk this type of person into the kingdom. I would like to think that I could sit down with them and reason with them. But there are some people, saints, that only God's intervention uh -huh. is going to save them. And God intervened in Saul's life. He met him on the road to Damascus. He knocked him to the ground with his glory. You know, it's like people say, Brother Robert, what do you think about people falling out? Well, let me tell you, he fell out under his sins. People say, well, he fell off a horse. Well, the text doesn't say that. He just fell. Because the glory of God was so great, he just went down on the ground. And then to cry out to the Lord, Lord, who are you? I'm Jesus, who you're persecuting. Saints, listen, that's the kind of move of God we need right here in this church. Amen. We need the Spirit of God to come down in this church to where people just say, Lord, who are you, Lord? Yeah. Lord, and then God begin to speak to them. Not a man speaking, not going secondhand, but the Holy Spirit beginning to deal in the hearts of people. You say, Brother Robert, is preaching important? Yeah, how, the, how shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they go unless they are sent? I believe in preaching. I believe in teaching. I believe in doing everything that I possibly can to see people get saved. But there are some things, saints, that only God can do. That's right. Amen. Only God's intervention can do. Amen. And saints, when we pray and we ask God, Lord, move in their life, you're praying a great prayer. You're praying a prayer that says their soul is more important than their wealth. Their soul is more important than their health. Their soul is more important than all of the temporal things of this life. Because when God gets a hold of a person, saints, sometimes it's not pretty. It's not pretty. But I would rather whatever it takes be done than be lost. Yes, amen. Who are we, who's with me this morning? Amen. Yes. I thought I would get shouted down. Thank you, Jesus. I would rather them go through a life of suffering uh -huh. and make heaven right. than suffer forever right. in eternal damnation. Amen. Amen. Lord, whatever it takes, save them, Lord. And undoubtedly, somebody was praying that for Paul. Maybe when the people were, were being stoned, somebody said, Lord, save this man. God had a plan for him. He was in darkness when Jesus found him. The light blinded him, showing him the darkness he'd been moving in. One preacher said it. Showed him all the times they'd been moving in darkness, thinking he was moving in the light. He was blinded. Somebody had to take him by the hand and to lead him away. What was it? I'll tell you what it was. It was the touch of the Holy Spirit. It was the glory of the Lord Jesus 
coming down, blinded him, changed him. He turned on a dime. Do you know that his life was so radically saved that when he was going before Agrippa and Festus and all them, he said that I began preaching first at Damascus. He went from persecutor to preacher that quick. He went from Saul to John the Baptist that fast. You say, how did it happen? Did somebody write a book and you read it? Oh, he was changed. And I'm all for books. I've written books. That's not what did it. It was the hand of God saying, this has touched him. And he was changed. Amen. We need revival in America. Yes, we, do. we need a revival in St. Joe. We need a revival in Buchanan County. Amen. We need a revival in Missouri. We need one in the Midwest. We need it to spread all over the world. You know, America has exported a lot of wickedness. But we need to start exporting the glory of God. Yes. We need to start exporting revival around the world. You say, how did it happen? You say, Paul, what happened? Somebody touched me. That's what he would probably say. Somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. I was blind, but praise his name. I now can see. I was in darkness when Jesus found me. But since he touched me, I now am free. How many of you know that old song? Yes. Somebody touched me. Somebody touched me. I was blind, but praise his name. I now can see. I was in darkness. When Jesus found me, but since he touched me, I now am free. Saints, listen. We need the touch of God on this land. We need the touch of God in our services. We need the touch of God in our lives when we go into the workplace. I want to be light that is shining in this darkness, pushing it back. And it can only happen with the touch of God on our lives. Saints, let's pray this morning. Father, we're so grateful.